When Sony launched PlayStation 3 in 2006, the promise of Full HD 1080p gaming was there alongside it. And while most games during this generation never came close, I've made it my mission to document as many Full HD games for PlayStation 3 as possible. In the last three episodes of DF Retro, we covered the system's library up through 2012. And now, in our final episode, it's time to wrap things up and complete our exploration of the 1080p library for the PS Triple. Stick around to the end and we'll find out which years offered the best 1080p gaming for PS3 and how many of these managed to reach 60 frames per second. But enough chat, let's do this. Twenty thirteen started just like any other year, but it is also the year of PlayStation Four. On February twentieth, Sony unveiled the new console to the public for the first time. It was decidedly a different beast from the now aging PlayStation Three, though more focused perhaps, and it would become a huge success, more so than PS Three. But the PS Three was certainly far from finished. Yeah, games like The Last of Us were huge, but not a ten eighty p experience. Of course, for fans of Chad Warden, he actually reappeared in this image the day after the reveal of PlayStation 4. I wonder what he thinks of the PS Quadruple, or heck, the PS Quintuple even. So if you were playing on a PlayStation 3 and searching for 1080p content, what did 2013 have to offer? Well, first up, Hatsune Miku arrives on PlayStation 3 in Project Diva F. While clearly derived from the Vita version of the game, this is actually a proper PS3 release this time and it takes full advantage of the system, well, mostly. Now if you're not familiar with Hatsune Miku, it's a popular series of music games from Sega using Vocaloid characters for the lyrics. This virtual diva concept made serious waves when it first arrived and remains popular to this day. In bringing the game to PlayStation 3, the developers increased the rendering resolution to allow for Full HD 1080p output, updating at, unfortunately, just 30 frames per second. The result is certainly good enough, but not necessarily amazing. Moreover, the game's UI is clearly upscaled from a lower resolution, which is likely given its Vita origins, and that lower frame rate is kind of unexpected. Still, the 3D models are beautifully anti-aliased, so it does look very clean and sharp during gameplay. A sequel would arrive in 2014 as well, but unfortunately I don't have a copy of that one, so it's not in this video. Just know that it does exist, and is apparently also 1080p. Yeah, if it isn't clear by now, outside of the games that Richard helped with, I purchased or already owned every single game in this video already, part of the reason why this has been such an undertaking. So how does Hatsune Miku stack up then? Well, given the lower frame rate and the scaled up 2D assets, I can only give this one 600 Ps out of 1080. It looks good, but it could be better. Something the next game would at least offer, apparently. But then we have something truly near and dear to my heart. This is Zone of the Enders 2, as included in the Zone of the Enders HD collection, but not as it was originally released. You see, the original version was developed by High Voltage Software and released in 2012. Problem is, that original version was terrible in terms of quality. 720p resolution, horrible performance, missing effects, bad texture work, so many problems. That's why it didn't show up in the prior year. But it was so bad that Konami actually commissioned a second developer, Hexadrive, to essentially remake the game again. And boy, did they do a great job. But its release is also somewhat special to me personally, as it was the second ever game I covered 
for Digital Foundry back in 2013. So yeah, we have some history. Now what Hexadrive managed to deliver here is nothing short of a miracle then. They basically rebalanced the game across the PS3's SPUs, solved all of the various rendering issues, and massively improved performance. Things like color banding and the textures and the ultra low res alpha effects were restored to their former glory. And in the interest of this video, the resolution was boosted to 1280 by 1080 for 3D objects with FXAA, but full 1080p for wireframe graphics complete with 32X MSAA. Now, performance of course was greatly enhanced with the game holding 60 FPS far more often compared to the often sub 30 FPS of the high voltage version. To date, this version of Zone of the Enders 2 remains the only remaster of a remaster that I can recall. And in fact, it's a really unprecedented situation. Now, this was the definitive version of the game for years until it was re-released on PlayStation 4 and even higher quality, but still, the PS3 version with this patch installed remains very impressive. Unfortunately, Zone of the Enders 1 did not receive this upgrade and remains somewhat flawed and missing effects. And of course, the awkward sounding localization is still in full effect here. I mean, who talks like this? Since I found Jayruki, you'll have to give it to me. What does Barra want with Callisto? Oh, you don't look like a mining man to me. Get lost. Still, as a result, I have to award Zone of the Enders 2 HD specifically a full 900 out of 1080. Why so high for a 1280 by 1080 game? Well, frankly, the image treatment, the huge task of managing all those particles and effects, and the super clean wireframe rendering all push that score way up. This is a superb remastering effort, and honestly, it's a shame Konami didn't contract Hexadrive out for the entire project. The next game then is a release from Square Enix. It's Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5 Remix. This includes a remix of Kingdom Hearts from PlayStation 2, as well as RE Chains of Memories or whatever, plus some extra bonus features on top of that. So let's begin with Kingdom Hearts Final Mix, the remaster of Kingdom Hearts 1. The visuals remain largely comparable to the PlayStation 2 original, but the UI has been upgraded and is mostly presented at a much higher resolution, and other things have been enhanced where appropriate. It is ultimately just an HD remaster of course, but the result is surprisingly good. The game is still 30 frames per second like the original, but the boost in resolution and improved asset quality go a long way. Plus the visual design is rather timeless I think, the quality of the character models and animation work is really well done. Unlike many of the games on this list, Kingdom Hearts utilizes dynamic resolution scaling, reaching native 1080p when possible, but also dipping down to just above 900p. It does not utilize any form of anti-aliasing, however, so you get those raw pixels, but given the nature of the visuals, it actually works rather well. Amusingly, if you choose 480i or 480p, you get 4x3 support just like PS2, which is something that no other version of these games offers. But if you choose HD resolutions, it of course plays in widescreen like this. Now, Chain of Memories is a weirder one though, as this is a remaster of a PS2 remake of a Game Boy Advance game. So it benefits in much the same way as the original Kingdom Hearts does. It looks a lot better on PS3. Now, these games would see release again in the future on other platforms, but the PlayStation 3 version is widely respected from what I can tell. It is certainly a packed release, that's for sure, and sets the stage for what's to come. While the remastering work isn't necessarily up to par with Bluepoint's best, it's still very good and earns a solid 900 out of 1080p's on the Full HD chart. In April, however, Vita and PlayStation 3 players alike were treated to the next game from Drinkbox. It's Guacamele, and this one is truly a phenomenal production. After the Tales from Space titles, Drinkbox opted for a less linear design and tried their hand at creating a Metroidvania. Guacamele follows the exploits of an agave farmer known as Juan, who is killed, sent to the land of the dead, then reincarnated as a luchador warrior on a quest for vengeance and love. The hook with this one lies in its wrestling-inspired combat and dual realities, which offers a more robust type of experience than typical Metroidvanias of this era. 
The game is expansive and beautiful, donning a slightly off-kilter but oh-so-stylish aesthetic, enhanced by strong animation work and richly detailed backgrounds. While their prior two games were certainly attractive, Guacamele is a dramatic step forward showing significant refinement in terms of realizing a coherent and unique vision. As a 2D side-scroller then, like certain other games in this list, Guacamele delivers a full native 1080p presentation on PlayStation 3, and even a native 544p presentation on the PS Vita. With its angular designs and fine grain in-surface detail, targeting such resolutions is a wide move that pays dividends with a very clean looking game as a result. Furthermore, this is yet another 1080p native title that manages to deliver a smooth 60 frames per second during gameplay, which again, is something I feel is critical for a side-scrolling action game like this. The fact that it does so even when the action heats up is key. So while it may no longer seem like a big deal to deliver a high resolution 2D game, I maintain that it's something that deserves praise, as it certainly was not the standard during this generation of consoles, remember. Most 2D games were still ultimately just 720p. With its perfect mix of visual styling and smooth performance at Full HD then, Guacamele comes in at 1065p's out of 1080. Not quite the best of the best, but it's darn close. Amazing work from Drinkbox. But the year of 2D would continue in July with the release of Vanillaware's Dragon's Crown. From the mind of George Kamitani comes an homage to Capcom's classic Dungeons & Dragons arcade brawlers, one of which he worked on. Dragon's Crown is a dark, quest-driven brawler with a ton of depth, multiplayer options, and of course that stunning Kamitani artwork. You can feel the love poured into its creation. You can always expect Vanillaware to shine when it comes to art direction, of course. It's true that the designs can be a little, huh, over the top, but I think it's a perfect fit for a game like this. The large, muscular figures and well-endowed cast members certainly dominate the action with serious screen presence. The game asks players to take on various quests in town, complete with a tavern, shops, a castle, and a guild, among other things. Once you accept your quest, you venture forth, selecting your next mission from a map so gorgeous it would make Jim Power blush. All of this is complemented by a super sharp presentation of Kamitani's art direction. The game outputs at a full native 1080p on PlayStation 3, bringing the artwork to life much as we saw with games such as Rayman Origins. It's an awe-inspiring piece of design work, honestly. I should note that other Vanillaware games would make an appearance on PS3, specifically Odin Sphere with its remake, but it doesn't benefit in quite the same way as Dragon's Crown when it comes to clarity. Now all of this is presented at 60 frames per second as well, which largely holds steady during the action. Yes, it's another 60 FPS 1080p game. Sure, it's 2D, but this is another great example of what a designer could create on this level of console hardware. Remember, the PS Triple was unfortunately rather outdated as of 2013, yet here we are still enjoying games with visuals of this quality. So as was the case with our last game then, I feel Dragon's Crown deserves a solid 1065 as well. Another sterling example of how to do high resolution 2D gaming on this older generation of hardware. Guess what comes after Dragon's Crown though? Did you select another 2D game? If so, you're right, and this time it's Ib and Ob, a cooperative platform action game with a rather cute aesthetic. Ib and Ob almost reminds me of From Software's classic on PlayStation 2, The Adventures of Cookie and Cream, in that it assigns each character to one of two analog sticks on the controller, then asks you to manipulate both of them at the same time to solve platforming challenges. It's simple and fun, and yes, of course, it can be played in two-player mode as well. This one seems to utilize clean vector art, much like other games we've covered thus far, but it features a more sparse design aesthetic. I only have the demo in this case, however, but I was surprised by the quality of this game. It's really fun and clever. And of course, it also delivers 60 frames per second, so it has that going for it. It's pretty clear by now that the formula for delivering 1080p60 on the PS3 
had settled into the realm of 2D gaming by 2013, after many games attempted to pull it off in 3D earlier. I think I'll hand this one a smooth, clean 800 out of 1080p, just like Drinkbox's first game, in fact. Not that this has anything to do with it. It's reasonably attractive, but not stunning. While the 2D train is rolling then, let's talk about Sound Shapes. This is the follow-up game from Queasy Games, the developer of Everyday Shooter, and it follows those same musical themes featured in that game. Except this time, it's a platform game. You control a small ball as you roll through the world screen by screen, hold the high-speed movement button to roll through the world, let go to stick onto certain surfaces, all while avoiding obstacles and adding to the beat. It is effectively a musical platformer, and it's brilliant. Not only does it feature a wide range of cool levels, each with their own musical tracks, it also offers a creation tool so you can make your own stages. When this game first launched, I followed its appearance on PlayStation Vita, which is where I played it, but the PlayStation 3 version is no slouch, offering a super clean 1080p presentation that is markedly improved over Everyday Shooter, which exhibits some aliasing. The smooth, flowing animation work matching the beat just feels fantastic even today, and everything of course updates at a fluid 60 frames per second with zero hiccups. Did you expect something less? The Vita version did have some slowdown though, so I suppose there was a chance for it here as well. Now I was very generous with Everyday Shooter, awarding it 980 points. Sound Shapes looks even better, but at the same time, years have passed since that game released. Thus, I will award this one the same, 980 Ps out of 1080. Our next two games though are perhaps a little more visually ambitious. First up, on August 13th, WayForward made a return to the PlayStation 3 with a remake of the legendary NES title, DuckTales. This is DuckTales Remastered, a game that's almost amazing, but falls just a little short as a result of a couple strange development decisions. The pitch is simple, of course. Recreate and expand upon that original NES game using new visuals and music. One of the project's claims to fame is the reassembly of the original DuckTales voice cast from the cartoon, including the late Alan Young who, despite his name, was in his 90s when he recorded the lines for Scrooge McDuck in this game. Uh, I'm not even going to dignify that question with a response. Alas, this is directly related to the remake's greatest problem as well, the cutscenes. So throughout the game, the voice cast is used to tell a story, which didn't really exist in the original game. Now that's all well and good, and the cutscenes are rather enjoyable at times, but they constantly interrupt the action on such a regular basis that it basically kills the game's pacing. Even with the option to skip cutscenes added via a patch, you still need to pause the game, then select skip it to continue. I'd have honestly preferred a separate no cutscene mode as an option instead. Still, if you can ignore that and just enjoy the cutscenes, what's here is pretty darn good. And there are even new stages included, along with optional improved controls, such as the easy pogo jumping. In bringing the game back to modern platforms, WayForward opted for a 2.5D approach. The characters and enemies are all beautifully drawn, high resolution sprites, while the backgrounds are full 3D with some 2D billboard elements. It's a different approach from many of the prior games we've discussed in 2013, of course, but I think it works rather well, and crucially, everything is displayed at Full HD 1080p, resulting in a very clean presentation. They also managed to deliver all of this at 60 frames per second, which is impressive given that it's not strictly a 2D game. Like Double Dragon Neon before, this one also features a phenomenal soundtrack by Jake Kaufman, featuring epic remixes of classic NES tracks such as this. So yeah, DuckTales Remastered is pretty good overall, and does well in terms of its 1080p-ness. I'd have to give this one a solid 1000 Ps out of 1080. But our next game is perhaps one of the most stunning titles we've examined today thus far. 
it's Rayman Legends, the follow-up to Rayman Origins. So this is a game I've purchased multiple times, as you can see, but I did not own this one on PlayStation 3. Thankfully, there's a demo, and that demo suggests that Yubi also did a great job in bringing it to the PS Triple. Now, this game was first pitched as a Wii U title, with multiple stages leaning heavily on the touchscreen functionality. But for the other consoles, Ubisoft adapted these sections allowing more traditional controls instead, and it works better than I expected, but the experience is certainly different. Only those platforms with touchscreens get the touch element, as you'd expect. This time, however, the quality and depth of the artwork is pushed up to 11, with so much depth and detail throughout, so many layers of parallax, combined with even more detailed bows and more polygonal elements even. It's just absurd how smooth everything runs in this game, given how much is happening on screen at any one time. This is the Ubisoft I love and honestly miss. Legends also includes these phenomenal music stages which basically combine rhythm game concepts with platforming to great effect. Of course, Rayman Legends is 1080p native on all consoles, from Wii U, PS3, 360, up through PS4, Xbox One, and the Switch. Even the Vita version runs at its native resolution. It's really that good. The UbiArt framework is certainly impressive in what it delivers. Honestly, I can't say enough good things about this one. It's just so much fun and so beautiful to behold. And it also runs at a solid 60 frames per second. This is one of the best games Ubisoft has released over the last decade, by far, and one I simply cannot recommend enough. This is a masterpiece in my mind, to the point where I'm awarding it 1,200 Ps out of 1,080. That's right, this baby is super sampled and busts through the score ceiling with ease. Phenomenal work. But then, on November 13th, this happened. That's right, PlayStation 4 arrived, and along with it, a slew of launch games. One of those games, and one that went somewhat unnoticed, is a little-known title called Super Motherload. It turns out that this one also made the journey to PlayStation 3, and it's a fun little digging game. But the interesting thing about this release is the fact that it's basically on par with the PlayStation 4 version. No, it's not pushing any technical boundaries, mind you but you get that same 1080p update at 60 frames per second, just like PlayStation 4. It's one of those curious things that you don't often see when a new platform is released. This kind of parody is remarkable in a sense. So while it's conservative in its design, I wanna give this one 950 Ps out of 1080, just for bringing that PS4 experience to the old PS triple. But there's one experience which probably should have made its way to PS4 as well. This is Gran Turismo 6, one of the last big exclusive PlayStation 3 releases to arrive for the now aging machine. This is pretty much the largest Gran Turismo game ever made. The game that seemingly pushed the studio so hard that it had to scale way back when building the follow-up. GT6 is gigantic in scope. Just in terms of sheer volume of content, there's so much here. In fact, it's so large that I almost dreaded the capture session necessary for making this video. One does not just sample Gran Turismo 6, though I did try. But let's start from the beginning here, with the installation. 
GT5 already takes a long time to install, but GT6 is a whole new level. It might be the single longest installation process in the history of console gaming. It takes hours upon hours upon hours to complete a full install cycle plus update. Once you're finally in the game though, probably the next day, you'll be presented with a wall of potential content organized within the main menu. This time, the menu is more subdued compared to Gran Turismo 5 and as a result, more information is presented with less loading. So in that sense, it's certainly an improvement. In terms of overall content, GT6 has more than 30 tracks with many different variants, almost 1200 cars, and just a ton of crazy different events, even ones on the moon. It featured online play, a course maker, up to six PlayStation 3s could also be connected for multi-screen action. It even features time of day changes on certain tracks as well as weather, and plenty of DLC on top of that. But the thing is, despite all this, and it being an excellent Gran Turismo game, it also feels like a game that arrived on the wrong machine. When Gran Turismo 6 arrived in stores in December, the PlayStation 4 had already been on the market for a month or so, and the aging PlayStation 3 struggled with performance in this game. Something we'll look at in just a moment. But this time, the resolution is actually boosted back up to 1440x1080 from GT5, which was 1280x1080, a 12.5% gain but the multi-sampling anti-aliasing was dropped this time in favor of MLAA, the post-process variant that runs on the cell, which produces inferior results to my eyes, so it's kind of a wash. Polyphony Digital really pushes the PS3 hard with this one though, introducing things such as bokeh depth of field and greatly enhanced motion blur during replays with a much larger sample count than prior releases. The game can honestly look rather superb at times, especially on the city tracks, pushing way beyond Gran Turismo 5 in many aspects. And that's why I feel it would have made a great early PlayStation 4 game, even a cross-gen experience. Release this at native 1080p on PlayStation 4 with a stable 60 frames per second, and I think it would have been very well received, I'm sure. I mean, this was right near launch. Gran Turismo 7 was a cross-gen game this time around, and that happened more than a year after the PS5 launched. Fundamentally though, it just doesn't run well enough on the PlayStation 3 when using the 1080p mode. There's near constant screen tearing across the top of the image and dips as low as the 40s, resulting in the least fluid Gran Turismo experience since the PS1 era. It's clear that the game really pushes the PS3 past its breaking point. The example we're looking at here though is just about the worst case scenario. Tracks with dynamic weather and dynamic time of day really struggle to maintain 60 FPS, rendering the 1080p mode almost useless in practice I feel. I say that because in 720p mode the performance is dramatically improved. You lose some clarity sure, but even the most intense track situations now operate much closer to that stable 60 frames per second target, offering a better gameplay experience all around. It makes it a whole lot more enjoyable, that's for sure. It's a shame they ditched the MSAA in this mode, but it's interesting to look at what was achieved here. But the situation around its release is interesting because Polyphony Digital is one of the very few developers that released PlayStation 3 games across the system's entire lifetime. It was there, right near launch with Gran Turismo HD. It produced multiple iterations of GT5, and then dropped this one last game right after the PlayStation 4 was already out. There is a clear evolution in terms of visual features, however. Environment detail is ramped up dramatically. Lighting and shadows become more robust and in some cases fully real time. Effects work is improved. Car models receive a ton more detail in addition to actual cockpits starting with GT5 Prologue. But it's also clear that none of this comes for free and by the end of the generation, we go from that stable 60 FPS experience with GT HD to a wildly unstable GT6, packed with screen tearing. But at the same time, it's not really apples to apples either. If you run that GTHD track in GT6 in a time trial, it's perfectly fine and runs very stably. 
It's only when you start to add in multiple cars and real-time lighting that things get out of control and GTHD never even attempted it. The fact that their first and last title both delivered results at 1440x1080 then is perhaps most interesting of all. We really get to see the limits of what the PlayStation 3 could deliver. So yeah, that's Gran Turismo 6, the last big AAA release for PlayStation 3 from a first party studio. And as I said, it's very, very good, but it falls short in terms of overall performance. So when considering the full HD score for this one, I think we have to take that into account. Given the ambitions then, I have to give this one 780p's, the highest score of any Gran Turismo game today. The performance may be lacking in certain modes, but it's an impressive package. Despite the arrival of Next Generation, PS3 had a great 2013 when it comes to 1080p games, with a final result of 931p's out of 1080. As 2013 came to an end, the days of PlayStation 3 were also nearing an end. PS4 was the new hotness and PS Vita was still relatively fresh, though its end was coming soon too, sadly. But that doesn't mean things were completely over for the PS3. As the PS4 generation got started, the age of cross-gen began, and many games would continue to arrive on PlayStation 3. Unfortunately, most of these conversions were extremely poor at best. After all, by this time, it wasn't really worth pouring huge engineering efforts into the aging PS3 versions, was it? Thus, it's no surprise that 1080p content started to dry up. That doesn't mean there weren't some games, however. So I guess the first game to mention for 2014 is none other than Final Fantasy X and X-2 HD remasters. Technically, this came out at the end of 2013 in Japan, but everywhere else in 2014. And it's an excellent remaster of a classic RPG. And amazingly, the PS3 version offers full HD 1080p support, in addition to a 720p option. The difference here is that 1080p lacks any form of anti-aliasing, but 720p uses FXAA. Furthermore, textures, pre-rendered backgrounds, and other assets were all cleaned up and enhanced in this version, while the soundtrack was fully remixed and improved as well. They then added real-time projected shadows into the mix, rather than circle shadows as seen on PlayStation 2, plus other improved effects. Of course, the models were also updated for the main characters, and not everyone loves these new models, but I think it works well enough in most cases. And all of this applies to both Final Fantasy X and the included Final Fantasy X 2. Yes, the dancing and bombast of the follow-up to Final Fantasy X is fully intact and presented in glorious Full HD 1080p. Just look at this. Much like Kingdom Hearts then, the game remains capped at 30 frames per second and has mostly little trouble maintaining this on PlayStation 3. It is not 100% flawless as there are occasional minor disruptions along the frame time graph. Nothing too serious, however, as the 30 FPS is, by and large, fully achieved in this mode. The only real disappointment here is that they didn't aim for 60 FPS, but given its roots on the PlayStation 2, it's entirely possible that that would have required work beyond the scope of this project. Oh well. Still, it's an excellent example of a remaster and a step above the work done on Kingdom Hearts HD 1.5. It also received Vita and PlayStation 4 ports, by the way, which are also excellent. So given all that, I give this one a solid 975 points out of 1080, as it offers an excellent 1080p experience that is worthy of Final Fantasy. After this in May, the world was treated to a little game called Sports Friends, a mix of multiplayer titles cobbled together into this neat little package. One of the primary highlights for me anyways is the tremendously entertaining Johann Sebastian Joust, a game that doesn't even really need an image on the screen at all, ironically. You and your friends all hold move controllers and the goal is to get them to move the controller just enough that it knocks them out of the game. It's really fun. The other games are also entertaining and, as the name implies, a lot of fun with friends. And of course, while this game is not focused on high-end visuals by any means, what is here is all presented at a pristine native 1080p with super clean vector artwork throughout. 
Again, it's just another example of how a simple concept like this can utilize the extra pixels to great effect. On top of that, it's also 60 frames per second, just like the PlayStation 4 version. It's not a technical powerhouse by any means, but I thought it was worth including. Since visuals are not the main focus though, and it's rather conservative technically, I think I'll award this one 750 out of 1080. Then, in June, Drinkbox returns with a follow-up to Tales from Space with Mutant Blobs Attack. And this one first arrived in 2012 on PlayStation Vita, but the development team then opted to port it over to the PlayStation 3 as well, and the result is fantastic. Essentially, just like their other games, Mutant Blobs Attack offers a full native 1080p presentation using super clean vector artwork again that allows the camera to scale in and out effortlessly without compromising clarity. I also feel like the art design is more refined compared to the first entry and the level design more enjoyable. As a Vita port, however, some concessions had to be made. Specifically, the touchscreen segments are now mapped to the right stick with L1 toggling between the various objects. It works, but is certainly less natural comparatively to using the touchscreen. Still, you get that same perfect 60 frames per second experience once again, just like prior Drinkbox releases, so it feels great to play. Honestly, their games are a real treat, very well made technically. Every single Drinkbox title is a strong example of how art and technology can work in tandem to create something truly polished. With these improvements then, I'd like to give this one 950 Ps out of 1080. It's better looking than the first game, but not quite on par with Guacamelee. Still, a worthy release for the PlayStation 3. A couple months later then, the world was treated to, uh, this. Yeah, so this is Ho Hokum, and it's something. So you basically drop into this strange, two-dimensional, possibly drug-fueled world piloting a long snake-like creature around, and of course this creature is delightfully known as the Long Mover. There's no obvious objective though, rather you fly around these various stages and zones, triggering actions and finding ways to proceed through the game. It's basically a game focused on relaxation and just enjoying the moment. But the presentation is superb. It features razor sharp 2D artwork, something I feel like I've said at least 30 times today, and it runs at native 1080p, like many other games in this list. There's no aliasing or edges to be found anywhere. The intended design is perfectly realized and executed here, and it all moves at a rock solid 60 frames per second as well, another 60 FPS title. In fact, at the end of this video, I will reveal just how many games we've covered today that actually run at 60 FPS. I think you'll be surprised. So yeah, given its stunning yet bizarre presentation, I have to award this one the full 1000 out of 1080. It's a beautiful game. We're making real progress here though, almost to the end guys, just hold on. Next up is the second Kingdom Hearts release. This is Kingdom Hearts HD 2.5 and you guessed it, it's a package much like Kingdom Hearts 1.5, an HD re-release of Kingdom Hearts 2 and Birth by Sleep plus recoded. So Kingdom Hearts 2 is once again a PlayStation 2 title that has been converted and enhanced for PlayStation 3. The HD rework is very similar to what we saw in the last game and generally excellent. It delivers similar image quality results with dynamic resolution scaling up to native 1080p. Birth by Sleep though is a little more fascinating for me as it's a conversion of a PSP game that was released in 2010. And it's one of the finest looking games on PSP as well I'd argue, a real technical powerhouse. And the HD version feels like a faithful and improved adaptation of that. The whole package is very well done, but doesn't necessarily take things quite as far as we saw with the Final Fantasy X HD collection, so I feel it deserves the same 900 points as the first released Kingdom Hearts game. Now this was pretty much the last major 1080p game for 2014 that I could find, and it was a strong one to end on, but from this point, the PS4 is truly the main focus of most publishers, and there wouldn't be that much else that fits the criteria of this episode. With just five games on the list for 2014, however, this one comes in at 915 Ps for the year. 
Now in 2015, there was at least one other 1080p native title to mention, a game known as Tennis in the Face. It's a cute little puzzle game focused on hitting a tennis ball and slamming as many people as possible on the way to the goal, which is not bad. A wild concept for sure, and certainly fun. And yeah, it delivers 1080p output at 60fps as well. Can I say Razor Sharp 2D again? Because yeah, it has that. But I'm not necessarily a fan of the art style, and it is a very simple game, so I'd probably have to give this one 650ps out of 1080. And with this being the only game on my 2015 list, that means that's the score for 2015 as well. Are there other 1080p titles though? I'm sure there might be. In fact, I was surprised by just how many games made it to this video in the first place. We're over 80 now. I think it's about time for that summary. With that however, the PlayStation 3 would begin to fade away, becoming relegated to the past. The PlayStation Store on PS3 was updated to match the current generation hardware, but unfortunately in doing so, the performance faltered. Just browsing the store became a chore, and some of the features didn't even work anymore. It was just slow, choppy, and increasingly non-functional. Over time, many games would be delisted, and Sony even threatened to pull the plug on the whole thing at one point. Yet, amidst the rubble, the PS Triple stands strong. Over the course of its life, the PlayStation 3 would amass more than 2,500 games, which is honestly a huge amount. And during the course of this video, I think I managed to sample most 1080p games for the system. Not necessarily all, but hopefully most of them. But if we're generous with those numbers, it's safe to say that just 3-4% to of the PlayStation 3's library offers 1080p rendering. So let's break down the data we've collected today. Firstly, which year offers the best 1080p games? Based on the results accrued over the course of this video, which were very scientifically calculated using my opinion as a basis, the award for the best year of 1080p goes to 2013, the year of PlayStation 4. Yeah, the rise of beautiful 2D games, HD remasters, and, well, Gran Turismo means that it comes out on top, but 2007 and 2012 are very close. You can really see the evolution over the lifetime of the system, with the first two or three years focusing primarily on bringing 3D games to the 1080p space, 2009-2010 were somewhat lacking in total number of titles, but then the rise of indie games, 2D games, and HD remasters meant that the latter years of PS3 were actually packed with some great 1080p examples. But there's another interesting factoid buried within. For this video, I featured 88 1080p or at least partially 1080p titles. Of those, 62 games run at 60 frames per second. An unexpected result. So what does this mean? Well, I think it kind of supports my point from the beginning of this video series, that budgeting your resources around a target frame rate and resolution early on in the project pays off big time in the end. Even on an underpowered system like PlayStation 3, 60fps and 1080p are possible in tandem, and I think this is something that developers can take forward to modern systems as well. Where does that leave the 1080p dream then? What was that original marketing all about? Well, it's pretty clear that it was not the standard. It was never going to become the standard. But at the same time, while 3% may not seem like much, the reality is that, given the hardware, I was actually surprised and impressed by the sheer volume of 1080p titles available for the system. In that sense, PS3 is a much larger library of Full HD games than Xbox 360 and Wii U combined, which was kind of surprising to me, I have to admit. With that, though, Hopefully you've enjoyed this journey through the life of PlayStation 3. Despite its many missteps, I feel like this year has marked somewhat of a resurgence for the system. I was all too happy to leave it behind back in 2013 when the newer machines arrived, but looking back, it still has that spark of classic PlayStation 1 and PS2 era Sony that has mostly disappeared in modern times. So perhaps against the odds, Chad was right all along, and the PS3 really is as ballin' as possible.